thanks very much for giving us your Saturday and the pleasure of your company at uh, William Anglis Institute's annual open day, the first one we've been able to do for a while for reasons you all know and I won't bore you with. And you're here today for our keynote event, which is a chat with our alumnus, uh, someone we're very proud of, Chef Shannon Bennett. So I'm going to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathering today, the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples participating in this event and in our open day today. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters upon which we reside. So to our guest of honour today, Chef Shannon Bennett was once at this same stage that some of you are at now, uh, sitting in an audience, I don't know if this uh, conference centre was built then, but let's imagine it was, and wondering what he's going to do. In fact, I think you'll find he was a bit, bit younger than some of you when he made that call. He studied here at William Angus Institute while working at the Grand Hyatt Melbourne in the early 90s and is a proud alumnus, as I've said. Following this, he worked under John Burton Race for two years, Marco Pierre White for two years, and Alain Ducasse at Hotel de Paris for a year before beginning his fabulous exploits that many of you will know and have experienced with View de Monde, and broadening this with the View Group. 2003, he was awarded Gourmet Traveller Magazine's inaugural Best New Talent. Uh, View de Monde was also awarded Restaurant of the Year in the Age Good Food Guy in 2013 and 14. Uh, Chef Shannon was invited to be the first Australian member of the Association de Jeunes Restaurateurs Europe, which is Young Restaurateurs of Europe, for those of you who speak French, um, please forgive my pronunciation, uh, and Le Grand Table du Monde, which, is the great, which means the great tables of the world. There we go, that ends my year eight French. Uh, in 2007, Bennett was guest chef at New York Star Chef Congress. He's the author of some stunning books. Who's got one or two of his books? Anyone in the house? Very good there. So we'll be asking you all the questions. Um, so they include 28 Days in Provence, Cooking All Over the World, My French View and My View French Cookery, as well as the Shannon Bennett Personal Guides, which I recommend, Personal Guides to France, London, Paris and New York, and has been on the distinguished list of chefs who have featured at our very own William Anglis Institute Great Chefs Program, where our students work along a master chef and put on a gala dinner. We do five or six of those a year, so, and they sell out very quickly, so please have a look. We just had Frank Kamora in recently uh, do a fabulous dinner. We had Ian Curley do a completely plant-based menu, and the guests didn't know that until the end of the meal. <laughs> and they're sort of going, I think I know what that is. Uh, so that was a nice little treat for everyone. However, many of you here today will know um, the other master chef that, that Chef Shannon is as a guest judge and mentor. And today, I'm just happy to say he's our special guest. And please help me welcome to the stage, Chef Shannon Bennett. It's a long intro. Cheers, mate. Uh, I, told him, I told Chef it was going to be a long introduction. So welcome back to Melbourne. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I was going to say, I wrote in my notes, welcome back to Melbourne and her weather, knowing that you live up in uh, the North Coast, but we've got a good one today for you. Yeah, it's amazing weather. Uh, Great to be back. How does it feel to be back at, at William Anglis? Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, so I first started coming to William Anglis when I, 1991 maybe? Uh, I think I graduated in 1995. So I think I was 15 or 16 when I started uh, educating myself uh, about the hospitality industry and uh, then was put in a, I think it was block placement uh, back then when I got an apprenticeship at the Grand Hyatt Melbourne. And, uh, yeah, so that was, that uh, used to come in and do sort of seven weeks and then plonk back into industry. Yeah, yeah, I think it was four weeks and then a three week stint um, and uh, you became like a little family in between that. It was so intense, the training and um, loved it, yeah. Look, there are probably a few of your chef's still wandering around, like Chef Bart and a few others that yeah, you may remember. Yeah, yes, yes. So I, good. I know Chef Bart very, very well. If you go back a little bit before that, because you were very young, what, what piqued your interest in the first place? Do you remember? Uh, well, I suppose when I was 12, I, my father's an engineer and he was placed in Bangladesh. Uh, and so uh, it was just impossible for me to be educated and live in Bangladesh at the time. So I was um, shoved across to London to live with my Uncle Tom who was a musician but also owned three pubs. 
And um, there was this guy who was like in his 50s, former musician, everyone knew who he was and um, had uh, like this amazing lifestyle. And um, he would just sleep at some of the pubs and take me with him and we'd go down to the kitchen and meet the chefs and they'd just cook us up something. I was like, this is the life, I love this. Um, <laughs> I love this lifestyle. It was sort of like a nearly a nomadic lifestyle, but um, it was just everything that was the complete opposite to my upbringing, and, um, which was in West Meadows, just out northern suburbs in, in Melbourne here. And so from there, I was like, I want to become a chef. I want to become like Uncle Tom. Um, I got a job at McDonald's and that sort of gave me a taste for, I suppose, how structured things have to be in the kitchen as well at the same time. And I enjoyed that. Um, and uh, so I just rode away to the Grand Hyatt Melbourne and a few other hotels and asked for a, for a job. And I didn't tell my dad he wanted me to be an engineer. And because um, at the time, literally hospitality didn't have the regard that it has now. And so um, it took a bit of convincing when I got the job to um, persuade my dad. And I remember it was always very, very clear. He didn't speak to me for about a day. And, uh, he was just, he was driving me somewhere and he just said, oh, I suppose, look, people have got to eat. And that was it. And so that was his <laughs> approval. Um, and, um, and then from there, it was about wanting to be the best. Um, that's, that's, it was striving for excellence was, was a key. And I think Grand Height Melbourne had that, um, it was a chef, executive chef named Roger Leinhard. He was really, you could hear him coming actually. He was about six foot 10, 130 <laughs> kilo, and he wore all these clogs and he was a Swiss chef, very traditional, um, but great dry sense of humour, um, but slightly scared me, uh, which is a good thing. And you could hear him coming down the hallway in his clogs and you just knew everything had to be tidy and ready. And um, it was his sort of drive for a pursuit of excellence that um, drove me. And he wanted the Max's restaurant, which was the signature restaurant at the hotel at the time, to be the best restaurant in Melbourne. And um, the only way that you could achieve that was through his philosophy was discipline and, and great ingredients. And um, so I just remember that from the age of yeah, 15, that's, that was what was driven into me and I loved it. I loved the buzz of that, of, of striving for that. So I didn't know the McDonald's bit. Uh, I knew a yeah. bit about Max's. Uh, so that, that's fantastic. I, I can say in hotels as well, we look at fast food students, uh, fast food uh, employees a lot because of those, that sort of SOP, you know, yeah. uh, good grooming, they've got basic, then we have to sort of, um, prepare them a little bit, so that was really interesting. I'm, I'm wondering the sort of foundation that you got, so you obviously got that from Chef um, Roger, but what about here at William Angus, what sort of foundational skills do you think that you learnt then that are still important today? I think it was the science behind food was um, something that I didn't understand until I, I came here, um, and also slowing everything down, so breaking down the techniques and um, everything in the restaurant is so rushed so you learn through your mistakes and that's how you refine your skills. Where here it was breaking down the structure of why we use that skill um, and also going back to classic recipes and classic techniques um, and even things like bread making. I mean, at the age of 15, I didn't know how bread was made. I didn't know the science behind it. So I always remember those basic little scientific formulas that I, I learnt at the time of, um, you know, why do we add vinegar and why do we add sugar to certain things to balance things out and why do we have different taste sensations on our taste buds? And um, I always remember one of the first things I learned here was bitterness is the key flavour um, profile. If without bitterness you don't have any other flavour and all those things then resonated with me when I started developing my own dishes. So they stayed with me for, for a very long time. Um, structure and, and discipline was also something and, and meeting different chefs from different... Um, sectors of the industry because my group had a, a lot of different chefs from different parts, from, from pubs to um, race courses. I remember there was a chef there and we all became this one family um, and we shared a lot of our different reasonings for being in the industry um, and what we needed to learn while we were here. So it was like a, yeah, it was one big family. Yeah, you've mentioned family a few times about your Anglis family and about your chef family, which is, which is something that I think a lot of us in the industry um, uh, love and you never lose that even going into education so yep. it's great you traveled quite soon after this didn't you what was what uh, obviously you had the experience in London what was the driver for getting overseas they always say Aussies uh, have to go overseas to make it before they get accepted back home do you think that's still true and is it true for chefs uh, not as much now no but when I 
obviously there was no internet. Uh, there was no websites for restaurants. So all I had was bookshops. And uh, I remember it was Angus and Robertson bookstore on the corner of Burke and Swanson Street. <laughs> had a basement with travel and cookery books. I used to go in there and um, I remember the ladies that were working down there used to then uh, allow me just to write all the addresses of all the restaurants overseas down and um, I'd read all the reviews and I'd just pick out the two and three Michelin star restaurants or they had the uh, the triple A guide for Britain. I'd pick out the five row set restaurants, um, which is the equivalent, I suppose, of the three chefs at um, what we have here. And um, I would just write to the chefs um, a year out from qualifying. I just was writing to them saying, hey, I'm going to qualify. Could you give me a job? And um, I remember I only got two replies. One was from, um, ironically, Gordon Ramsay, who just started his own restaurant called Aubergine. And uh, he just picked up a Michelin star. And I didn't, couldn't find anything on Gordon Ramsay, so I didn't um, accept his offer. And I, I, I took up... <laughs> Who's this uh, bloke? <laughs> yeah, I didn't really have much on him at all. Um, and so I accepted a job from John Burton Race, who um, I was able to read a fair bit about. He'd had a book out and was striving for three Michelin stars. So that was, for me, why I wanted to go overseas. I just I wanted to work with the best um, and try and test myself uh, to see um, if I could make it uh, to the top. Fantastic. We, we embody that a little bit when our students go on internships and some of our other courses as well, um, getting them to work with us on the application process because we think that ability to want to want it is, is just as important as the process. So that's a great story of writing down the old addresses. That sort of, that makes my clipboard look a little less uh, naff when you tell that story. The days before the internet, folks. I think anyone's wanting to do uh, what I've done, it's, it's easy. Just, um, just have your, you know, your heart on your sleeve and um, keep it simple and keep it you and just be extremely excited by the opportunities that you'll get um, and, um, yeah, just be passionate and it'll come to you. And just keep believing. That's the key is belief. There's a lot of days uh, where the, uh, the very, very bad days make the good days and that's how I looked at it. Nice, thank you. Um, so you mentioned John Burton Race. Uh, you also worked with Marco, Pierre White and Alain Ducasse. Yeah. What did each of those chefs teach you? Uh, well, John Burton Race was crazy. Um, that was uh, <laughs> in, a, in a fun way. Um, you know, he was just fly by the seat of your pants, change the menu in the morning, um, just incredibly uh, just erratic uh, but incredibly creative. Um, didn't really uh, care much for hierarchy in the kitchen. Um, so I learnt an extreme amount in a very, very short amount of time. And um, he used to love um, us Aussies, is what he would say, and because we would just get in there without any inhibitions. Um, cooking in, in Europe, one of the main reasons also I wanted to go was that cooking in Europe is regarded as a profession. And it wasn't really regarded as a profession at the time here. So it was all the top positions in all the hotels and all the restaurants in Australia were filled by European chefs. Um, very rarely was it for an Australian chef to, to be at the top. I think the only two were Maggie Beer and Stephanie Alexandra, who Steve Pallett, um, Steve's still here, I think. Is he still one of the teachers at the time? He used to be the ex-head chef of Stephanie's. And um, Stephanie's was the best restaurant in Melbourne at the time. It was in Hawthorne. And uh, we used to have this top 100 restaurant ranking system, very, very similar to what it is now. And Stephanie was always in that top 100. And uh, we were fortunate enough every year at our sort of finishing our seven week block at, here at uh, the college, um, Steve would take us to Stephanie's for dinner. And um, that was always the highlight. Wow. Was going to Stephanie's. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, well, it was amazing. Yeah, so, so both very good friends still of William yeah. Angus. Um, yeah. Stephanie's done a great chef's for us, but also um, Maggie Beer's, the Maggie Beer Foundation's doing great stuff in aged care. Yeah. So we're also yep. working to see what we can contribute to that, obviously, post the, the Royal Commission. Yep. But um, no, Steve's unfortunately not still teaching with us, but obviously much loved. Yep. Um, okay, that's really great. I'm wondering if the audience might have any questions about those early years or inspiration, motivation, or any <laughs> comments? Oh, good. I wanted to ask, you uh, ask when anything. you were kind of starting off, you mentioned that 15 and 16 were kind of the beginning ages of when you first started getting into it. Yep. That's the current age I am now. So I'd like to ask kind of from me being 15 now to you who was 15, what were some of the major things that made you 
stand out and what do you think are some steps or anything that could guide me or other chefs around my age to yeah. kind of progress as quickly or as much as they can? Yeah, I think, um, look, if I had my time again, age is not a barrier. So it's just a matter of if you're ready at 15, you know you want to enter the industry and you know you want to pursue it as a profession. And um, it, it can take you anywhere um, being in this industry. And so for me, I would, I would just say to you is that take your time, don't put too much pressure on yourself, but just be incredibly passionate and believe. Just keep believing because it's hard to, the industry is very, very different now than what it was when I grew up where um, there was a lot of aggression in the kitchen. There was very few female chefs in the kitchen. Um, so there was a lot of masculinity. Uh, there was a, a lot of aggression, um, a lot of, uh, I would uh, suggest to say, people in the industry at the time or in the kitchen that had, had enough, burnt out, didn't want to be there. So you, you had a lot of, um, I suppose, things against you at the time where you were, you know, a lot of negativity. Um, and you had to just carve through all that and just see the passion from certain chefs and see what was on the plate and see, there was no open kitchens either in those days. So you didn't really get to see the guests smiling and having an amazing experience. So now you've basically got a foundation where you don't have to experience some of those negativities, but now what you experience is so many bits of information that I didn't have. So there was not a lot of distraction for me where you've got all this distraction now of social media, um, <laughs> websites, so many different variations of recipes online that you look up and um, that can all be overwhelming and all can actually distract you from what you are as a cook because in, in many ways you start off as being a cook and you turn into becoming a chef and then you eventually become an artist. You just, you, you sort of, the progression takes maybe 10, 20 years but in the end that's what you will become if you're really passionate. And people will just want to come and see your art and see you and your team perform. And um, take your time doing that and try and absorb as much as you can, travel, find you, who you are as a person um, and try not to be distracted too much by all the noise around with all the information that you can gather. It can be a blessing, but it also can be such a negative at the same time. Hope it answers your question. Very candid, thanks, Chef. Thank you for your question. What's your name? Jack, well done. Good start. We didn't set him up for that. That's just <laughs> very authentic, Jack. If you don't ask, you don't know. Well yeah. done. Thank you. So you got it there, the shortcut. You might be sitting here one day, Jack. Oh, you will be. You've got to believe in it. You have to believe in it. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, good. See, Jack, look what you've done. Okay? Well done. Hello. Um, uh, nice to meet you, Simon. Um, my name is Bianca. Um, coming from a almost different end of the spectrum, um, I'm looking for a career change. I'm a nurse at the moment and I have been in the industry since 2015, um, but I've always had a passion for cooking um, and that kind of creative nature, And but I think I've been blocking that a lot. Um, and so, you know, probably during COVID, it's gotten me thinking and I think it's gotten everyone thinking about what we really want for our lives. Um, and, yeah, so I guess... Do you have any advice on that kind of transition, um, not really being in the food in industry um, before? Um, I have worked with kids in cooking when I was in high school, so I think there has always been that passion. Um, but just, yeah, steps and kind of getting over those nerves of that, you know, big transition. Yep, yep. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, yeah great question. I, look, I think that... Um, Jack was uh, obviously 15. His question was um, something that was easy for me to relate to because I entered the industry so young. But I think what the advantage that you've got now, is Bianca, was it? Um, is all the information. So you could pick up what you um, may be expected to know if you enter the kitchen for the first time on the internet and all the information that's out there in terms of learning the basics, looking at tutorials in YouTube and and being able to set yourself up ready for some experience actually in a, in a proper kitchen. And I think um, all great kitchens admire anyone who gives up one industry to go into the next industry. Um, there's actually a chef at Butte at the moment by the name of Tom who is a lawyer, was a lawyer, uh, went on to MasterChef. Um, I didn't do that well on MasterChef, but um, 
straight away put his hand up, wanted a job at Vudemont, and he's now the head pastry chef at, at Vudemont. Yes. So, it, and that was quite a quick progression. So you'd be surprised how much of your nursing background and your maturity helps you when you enter the industry, and um, you'll, you'll pick it up extremely quickly. The thing is that you'll find that people will just assume that you know more because of mu your maturity, and then that's where you can actually, um, obviously, I suppose, streamline your education by saying, well, that was expected of me. I better look that up. And you can even, even on your phone, in your break, just quickly look it up and look up a recipe or look up a technique or method, and um, it'll help you immensely. And so I think that just follow the passion. Just follow that, that you know in your heart that this is the right thing for you to do. And I think at the end of the day, too, you've got to become an entrepreneur. You, and at your age, you, you probably know that you've got the ability and belief to become an entrepreneur. And I think that that's what I try and teach anyone that's ever worked for me, is that you are working your butt off for me now to own your own establishment someday. Um, and I do not want you working for me in 10 years' time. That's not the industry. Um, it's your industry is that by then you should have enough belief, enough education, uh, enough skill to really showcase who you are and put your personality on the plate. So yeah, good luck I, with it. I, I think that's superb, especially I take on the bit about um, maturity being an advantage. Uh, we, and, and there's probably a few fallacies about William Angus. Actually about 40% of our students are what we call mature age, which is 23 and above. We have a lot of career changes. Uh, so I would obviously share the sentiment about getting to know it a bit better, but also coming in and, um, and joining us. You, you, you would have a, a bunch of folks here that are telling similar stories. Yes, Pia. We have had some material students take advantage of the dual qualification in cookery and patisserie, streamlines, two quals, so you're getting through it quite quickly. Um, with a lot of skills and one of the girls who got all the, a whole bunch of awards at graduation was actually a mature age student, so go for it. Yeah, you're still young. <laughs> uh, um, so fantastic questions. Thanks, Bianca. Thanks, Jack. Any other questions from the audience around this topic? Thank you. Got a question for Mr. Bennett. At the time you were at the Anglis, William Anglis Institute, what is it like? What is it like to be there? What's it like to be uh, studying at William Anglis? Uh, yeah, at the time. At the time. It was, uh, the th it, it progressed. It was daunting at, at, at the start, um, being 15 and being uh, at William Anglis and being one of the younger students here, uh, incredibly daunting, but at the same time, um, exciting. And um, I think that at the time, William Anglis was, uh, in my mind anyway, was this revered, I didn't ever think I'd be here. I think, you know, the belief that you have at 15 is very different to the belief you have at 18. And um, I, I didn't know the process really of an apprenticeship. So um, the first year was very daunting and at the end, I had a huge amount of confidence. And um, that was through the teachers here. So they gave you a huge amount of confidence. And um, there was a nice little link up too with the fact that a lot of the chefs back then knew each other. So Steve and Bart would know a certain chef that would work with me at the Grand Hyatt. And so it was, it was all linked and they'd be checking in on you to make sure that you're progressing well and you're learning. Um, so there was a very, very good support network as well, which is now increased because of technology. So now you're always in touch with your teacher and your other students. Um, back then there was no emails, there was, there was no social media. So th that, I mean, looking back on it, um, it was incredible how actually we, we all had that connection that we still kept for so many years after we qualified. But so much easier in that regard now um, when you come here. I don't think it'd be as daunting as how I felt it was daunting. Um, and I think that you'll find that you'll blend in pretty quickly. So yeah, that, that, thanks Chef, that proximity to industry is what makes this place truly special. So you're absolutely right, our chefs are still tapped in. In fact, we compel them to go back to industry a couple of weeks a year to keep current, and that's, that, that's something they love to do. Um, I, I obviously like them teaching, but because <laughs> sometimes they go out, I think, you've got to come back. Well, uh, uh, could I add, I think, yeah, sorry, sure. I think no, that yeah. um, the future of, of education here, we were talking about earlier, is going to be 
that link up where on the job training linked up with here, where things that you learn here, you just simply can't learn on the job, but vice versa. And I think that having teachers connect to you in your workplace is gonna be the future and then connecting all that with technology. Because don't forget when you, when you start here, it, no matter what, it will be daunting your first day here, what have you, but don't expect everything to happen overnight. It, it is like there's a lot of knowledge. And so confidence takes time and you're gonna to have to give yourself time Give yourself the expectations that learn from mistakes and learn from failure. Um, everyone, if you don't have make mistakes, then you're never going to progress. You're never going to be the best you can be. So that teaches you here to accept failure and, and learn from it. And very, very important um, in the evolution of you being who you are as a person and also as your profession. So um, yeah, don't, don't be too hard on yourself when you first start here. And your network and your teachers that are here, yeah, they stay with you uh, long after you qualify. Thank you. What was your name? Name Saw. Name yes, Saw. Thank you, Saw. Soul. Oh, thanks, Soul. Great question. Um, I'll just pause for a second uh, and welcome the Honourable Sally Cap, Lord Mayor of Melbourne. Uh, we've also got here today Dr. Anne Aston, who's the chair of our board, a fantastic chair, great supporter of everything we do, and our acting chief executive officer and my great colleague Wayne Crosby who may or may not have been a teacher back when Chef Shannon was around. He was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those meet, meet your teacher moments. It's fantastic. So we've talked a little bit just to, to update you. We had a little chat about, um, about early days and obviously about the influence of William Anglister and then the nature of apprenticeships and, and how it all works together and what you said then about technology on, on the job learning. I'm in the middle of... Uh, uh, an education strategy for <laughs> 24 to 26. Oh, I might pick your brain about that later. Problem. Thank you. Um, so we might switch a little bit, if you don't mind, Chef, to talk a little bit about the craft and the cuisine, if you don't mind. Uh, so I was thinking the classic question you ask a chef, signature dish, how long did it take to create? Or is every day a signature dish? Yeah, I think they uh, food evolves. So I think um, signature is it's an unusual word. But I think when you are striving for excellence and you want the best restaurant that you can possibly create, it's all about ingredients. It's all about your suppliers. Um, and it's also about culturally putting all that together, curating it onto a plate that depicts where you are. So for me, it was trying to depict Melbourne. Melbourne was, um, uh, there was one thing that was always bothering me is the fact that you can go to Paris and eat in a great restaurant and you know you're in Paris. But Melbourne was always striving, as I was growing up as an apprentice, to be like Paris yes. um, in a restaurant scenario. And I didn't, I'd, I'd felt dissatisfied with that. And I wanted to create um, and help get everyone an understanding and give everyone an understanding of what food culture in Australia was like and try and to help create an identity. So from a signature point of view, um, it was more about the theatre of giving someone a dish that showcased a really great producer. Um, and try and do it simple, but at the same time, try and do it in a way that you couldn't produce it at home. Um, and so sometimes theatre came into it more importantly, sometimes technique came into it, sometimes it was just a beautiful piece of ingredients um, that you know that you would never be able to buy at home, such as uh, like marin, uh, freshwater crayfish, things like that that, would, you know, that are quite rare and, and hard to obtain. Fantastic. And I think, I think we can all agree you did that very well and put the authenticity of Melbourne in place. Thank you. The Lord, Lord Mayor just gave you oh. a <laughs> Oh, look, I think it's, I, I, I'll add one thing is that it was about, um, there was a uh, author named Charmaine Solomon who I met, uh, Flavours of Melbourne. And I was just fortunate, I was going past um, Hill of Content and her book was in the window. And I went in and I said, uh, what's this book about? And Charmaine was actually there, just finished a book signing. So I got to meet her, had a coffee with her, and that's how Viewdemont at Rialto sort of started to become the way it was because she gave me all these amazing ideas of what food culture was like in the 1850s here in Melbourne. And it was the, Melbourne was the epicenter. It was basically the gold rush had given Melbourne so much wealth. 90 tonnes of gold was being pulled out of, the, out of the mines all around Victoria. And where did that, all of that money go? It basically came to Melbourne. So it had all these incredible hotels, like the Windsor Hotel is still here. Um, there, was, there was all this um, 
eyes, the world's eyes on, on Melbourne. And famous cocktails were invented in Melbourne. Um, not many people would know that French onion soup was invented in Melbourne by a French chef. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yep. Um, the Cliveden Hotel is uh, where the ANZ building is now on Collins Street. That used to be a hotel until it burnt down in about 1865. But all of that gave me the inspiration to um, really transform View de Monde in its fit out and make sure that the, the decor sort of reflected what culturally I saw growing up as a child and what resonated with me being an Australian and a Victorian and a Melbourneian and to what materials were available that were local and what artisans, what crafts people were doing with tables and furniture and, um, and then bring sustainability into it. And um, that was a really exciting time to start developing the ideas of what signature meant and what, um, what it felt to be an Australian chef or a Melbourneian chef. When you were talking then about some of the history, I was thinking of our special collections down in our Learning Resource Centre. We have the first Italian cookbook ever written in Australia. Not the first ever Italian cookbook, but the first Australian Italian cookbook down there. That you, We might have to get you down there to have a little look. Yeah, I'd love to see it. So, so that's great. So, so for you, a signature is more about everything around it. So your producers, yep. your suppliers. I, I remember reading um, Kitchen Confidential for the first time and there's the chapter on Bigfoot. Uh, and it's, it, for those of you that have read that book, you read that chapter in horror. And it's about an, another approach of some of the chefs that we would have grown up with and the way they treated their suppliers. What, what's that relationship with suppliers? Obviously, you, I loved what you said then about showcasing a producer. That was really humble. What is it for you as a, as a leading chef? How important are those partnerships? Oh, immense, because they're, they become part of your family as well. They're... Um, they work so hard to produce this amazing produce and you don't realise the risk that they take um, in producing um, incredible produce and, and the financial risk and the emotional risk um, that they take. People like um, Ben Blackmore, um, Blackmore Wagyu, I'm not sure if anyone knows David Blackmore and Ben, his son, but they uh, started producing um, Japanese style grade beef and David Blackmore is a geneticist um, that was working in Japan in the 80s and uh, was genetically able to understand why Japanese beef was so revered and why it was so such good quality. And what basically we look at beef and we look at the, the fat on the outside where the Japanese look at all of the fat into muscular, so like this snow through, through the beef. And that was because they banned beef for 300 years and um, they just didn't have enough supply when they were at war with England. So they used all, all of their cattle as working cattle. And so all of that, um, that fat turned into energy and that energy source sat within the muscles. And so then when they started to consume beef again, genetically it had changed. So David understood all that, mapped out the history of it and was able to get uh, genetic codes and slowly breed that back into black Angus beef until it was 100% Wagyu, which I think took him 30 years to do. And then he started, he was the first ever beef farmer in the world to supply beef back to Japan and be able to call it Wagyu beef um, out of Alexandria, um, northeast Victoria, two hours drive. And so it's, um, and so to meet, you know, those guys and be able to have um, their, their beef on the menu is nearly 20 years ago now when, um, when they just knocked on my door. It, you know, they told me that story. I was sitting there gobsmacked for two hours listening to it and then had to go and visit the farm, just needed to see it. For me then, you know, you've got to showcase that, that beef in a way that you're not ruining it. You're, you're giving people the best experience they've ever had and they want to come back again for it. So, um, and that relationship still exists with, with David and Ben and still keep in touch with them. And, you know, I could tell you about fish the same. Mark Ether, our fisherman. Um, there's Brett Collars, who's um, down the Mornington Peninsula. These guys used to be trawler fishermen and they gave up all their, their trawling gear. They knew what they were doing to the environment. They went to Japan. Um, studied the art of ikajimi and brain spiking fish and the quality that that gives, and then um, started knocking on restaurant doors with all this amazing quality fish. Um, so first time I ever saw Mark Ether's fish um, was actually in Japan at Skiji Market. I was with Neil Perry, um, who a lot of you might know, and we saw this fish in the market and we were like, you've got an Australian flag there, who supplies this fish? And the guy just laughed at us and didn't realise that we didn't know who Mark Ether was. Um, he's classified as a master fisherman over there and 
we weren't even using his produce. So as soon as we got back, we had to, it took six months to convince Mark to supply us fish. Wow. Um, and so those it's things. our comment before about going overseas to get famous. Before yeah, you come yep, back. yep. So yeah. it's slowly changing it's with all the information available now, but great produce and great producers. Um, yeah, there's, there's, that's, that's what motivates you each day to be cooking in a restaurant um, with, that, with that sort of produce. And that's why um, apprenticeships are so important because part of the program that we have in Vue de Monde is that we actually get all of the apprentices on their days off out to these farms and give them a great day. There's one tomorrow actually, um, we're taking Claire Smythe up as well to, to Blackmore's and doing a barbecue where they get to talk to David, um, get to talk to Ben, meet other chefs and get to see what's happening on that farm and become really inspired. When I was listening to you then, not just on the content of the story, but on the ability to tell stories as well, which, which our industry partners have told us is, is a really important skill set. Everybody, hands up if you're salivating right now and you're dreaming about lunch, yeah, okay. So for those of you, for Jack, for Saul, for Bianca that are thinking of the industry, I'd, I'd also add that skill set is transfixing listening to Chef talk about the story of that food, the provenance, who are the people involved, and that, that adds a level of value to your experience that makes it just so special. Um, so, Well, as a chef, you. it gives you value as well. Like you get to, you're a connector. So even if it's, um, I know John who grows asparagus in Werribee, and this guy just, all he does is grows asparagus. And his aim is the thickness and the color and the flavor um, and the quality of the soil, not using any chemicals. Um, and you know, he's been doing that for 30 years before organic um, vegetable growing was even heard of. Um, so these, these people, there's a lot of pioneers and that's what you call them. Um, and Australia's got so many of them um, and it's great discovering them. And as a, as a chef, you're, you're gonna, you become a great connector and you have to become a great communicator. I've written that word down, connector. Audience, please, you've been so good. We, we had three fabulous questions. Jack's back, is there, just before we get to you, Jack, is there anybody else? Who, yeah, sure. Have you <laughs> ever lost your passion for cooking? And if you did, how did you gain it back? That's a really good question. Um, yes, yes, I've definitely lost passion for cooking. Um, over the years, you, you burn it. I mean, in the industry, burnout is a, a regular thing. And, um, how you get it back is you take time for reflection and um, also when you take time for reflection, cooking at home is a great way. Um, pleasing the people that you love and around you is always a great way to reconnect with why you're in the food industry and why you're in the hospitality industry. Um, and also for me, you take the industry so diverse. So obviously from a cooking perspective, when you feel burnt out and you feel like the, the passion is starting to lose a reflection is a really good uh, tool where you basically can do something else in the industry and just take a little bit of a back step. For me, being a head chef is, is a progression and going beyond a head chef, there is so many other areas that you can actually continue to evolve into. Um, and I see head chef being a stepping stone to other things. So for me, after that, I, I became a restaurateur is, is I suppose the way I looked at it. I focused a lot on wine as well. I, started to put a program together that I spent a lot of hours on where um, training sommeliers. And um, I watched a program called SOM, a documentary, and there was um, a thing on there about master sommeliers and you have um, three questions, that's all it is, the exam, and you only have uh, three attempts at doing it over your lifetime before you can't sit that exam again. There's only 167, 168 um, living and dead in the world that have ever passed it. So, I had a couple of guys that were working for me that I just was, I knew that were incredibly skillful. So I spent three years um, getting those two guys over the line, um, got them to become master sommeliers. And so that was something that got me back into the industry in many ways. I focused on that for three years. We traveled a lot, um, Dorian, Carlos, uh, they're still at Butamon now, but both of them became master sommeliers and um, that reinvigorated me incredibly. That's with the court of master sommeliers, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's um, oh, the amount of hours. Tough. Yeah, yeah. One of the questions is basically three glasses of wine, and um, you may be requested. Obviously, you need to know everything about that wine. You need to know the grape variety. You need to know the who produced it, where it was produced, um, what vintage it was, 
um, and then you may be asked to draw a map of the vineyard where that wine came from. So that's the knowledge. If you haven't seen the, the um, doco called SOM, um, S-O-M-M, I recommend it, but that inspired me that there's so many facets in the industry that if cooking on the stove, you know, obviously um, it's intense, um, it's unforgiving at times, um, but yet it's so addictive and rewarding that you do take time away from it. Um, there's so many other areas you can recharge in the industry. Fantastic. So we, we do a lot of um, wine design, wine courses here as well. So if you need time off the tools and you want to come in and do a, a short course with us, you should think about that as well. Um, I've done level one of that course. I got a, I got a Barossa <laughs> Shiraz. You can't get luckier than that. And I was in Malaysia when I did it. You beauty. But I can tell you those three wines aren't classic varietals from, oh. from those places. They're, you know, they're all out of shop. So. Yep. That's awesome. So you've, you've done that a bit, haven't you? You've, you've, um, you mentioned so many different aspects to your career, the art, artistry, the storytelling, the connection. You've transferred to being an author, TV presenter, creative designer. And certainly you're not alone in the field in terms of making some of those transitions. You've made them better than some. Um, what is it about chefs that, are, that allows them to, to, to transfer into those different fields? What is it about the the art and craft of it? I think it's a discipline um, of, you know, particularly your apprenticeship and then um, the commitment that you give to that apprenticeship. And then after that, the progression that it takes to become a, a, a head chef, um, it's not easy like many industries. So it gives you plenty of time to, to plan. And I think that planning, you pick up other skills along the way. And I think, um, well, for me, it was talking to guests was a great way to practice my presenting skills and, and learn that there's other facets of the industry that um, can make you complete. And um, hospitality is always going to be in my DNA and in my blood, but there's so many areas, as you mentioned, design. I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated with design. So you connect with furniture makers. Um, you connect with people in the industry that um, everyone from your florist to architects. Um, and there's so many like areas that you want to be the dumbest person in the room. And so I'm just drawn to that fact that architecture, I love architecture. Um, I want to be around these people that are incredibly smart um, and I, I know nothing about architecture, so I, I want to learn it. And I think as a chef, you're drawn to that. You and, and not just a chef, anyone one in hospitality, you're drawn and you're admired by the people that come into the restaurant and dine with you and you're intrigued why, why they're spending their hard-earned money you know, in a restaurant um, you're working so hard to produce this experience for them. So once again, there's a little connector to the, to the guest and you're intrigued by what they do for a living and you want to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, there's another thing here though. There's curiosity and acting on curiosity that I think has been throughout your journey when you started as the, as the high schooler. That's really important and we, we want our students here too to be responsible for their learning, to take ownership, not wait for a trainer or a chef to tell them, to go out, seek it. You don't know it, seek it. And I like how you said that about not being the smartest in the room. No, I use it all the time. If you're the smartest in the room, it's time to move to another room. That's what I say. I just, uh, <laughs> that's that, and that's, that's, that's when I think you lose your passion for cooking a bit too. Quite you just, you, but you don't need to leave the industry. You just need to progress. Um, and there's so many areas you can progress in. Thank you. We agree uh, strongly. Oh, Lord Mayor, please. Right. Of course it is. Lovely to see you. Yes, lovely, lovely to see you. Back in Melbourne. Uh, uh, thank you. You are renowned for your fine dining and your innovation in the sector, but your uh, passion and creativity and focus on quality could apply anywhere in the food chain, if we can call it that, from food trucks yep. and cafes all the way through to fine dining. Can you Definitely. tell us a little bit about some of the... Um, examples or people that you've admired over your time that are in completely different establishments to yours? Oh, there's so many, yeah. I mean, from great coffee. Um, I think there's, for, you know, like um, Five Senses Coffee Roasters, um, you've got Mark at Seven Seeds. Um, and uh, I, I actually made, not made, but I encouraged all of my team to actually come along with me and do, you know, cupping sessions and learn how to make a cup of coffee that progressed then into Five Senses uh, and Mark from Seven Seeds actually running a barista competition for anyone 
It could be a kitchen hand. It could be a young waiter, young chef. You can all learn to make coffee, great coffee, um, and understand what a skill it is and what cultural significance it has for Melbourne that I still say that Melbourne has the best coffee in the world and the way that we, um, I know, appreciate our coffee but also demand good coffee, there's nowhere else like it in, in, in the world. Um, but then that extends to food. I mean, uh, Melburnians are incredibly spoilt but also incredibly uh, proud of the food options that they have. And that's partly because you said earlier about Italian food, Greek food, um, Vietnamese food. I mean, if you go down Victoria Street, you have the best examples of Vietnamese food anywhere in the world. Um, and um, that led me to open a, a Vietnamese restaurant in the Botanical Gardens because I had a great kitchen hand working for me, David, that was just amazing cook. He would do these meals for us out of literally leftovers from the fridge. And um, I was like, David, we've got to open a restaurant. Um, wow. And so that for me was just... How was David's like, reaction? <laughs> Oh, he, he, confidence, because he had so much confidence in, um, you know, sadly David um, had cancer then a few years later and had to give up, but we still keep in touch. But he still passes on that knowledge now to the team that is still there at Judd in Tan. And, um, and, you know, he took us to these restaurants down Victoria Street that I would never have even guessed, you know, what they were famous for, one particular dish, and that's why you go there. And then, then the Vietnamese community that was fifth generation by then, um, and, um, yeah, that, that's why I think Melbourne has got to get, get be a chef and try and put it on a plate is really difficult and try and explain it to someone in France, you know, where they say Australia doesn't have a food culture. Mm. Well, if you come to Melbourne, you can actually see a food culture developing in front of us. And um, it's incredibly exciting. And obviously a lot of you people here wanting to be in the industry today will be a huge factor in making that actually grow and actually be identified. We'd, I'd love to be able to say in 10 years' time we can identify what is Melbourne's food culture in one sentence. That would be really exciting. It would be. Um, what, what I learned from that too was that ideas come from anywhere and you mentioned before about uh, one of your mentor chefs disrupting the kitchen brigade and not really having a hierarchy mm. and the idea that the kitchen hand opens the restaurant is sensational. Um, it totally disrupts that kind of them, there's only one way to run a kitchen team. I think yeah. I really, yeah. I really like that story in terms of modern leadership. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you had another question. I didn't forget you, promise. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, well, for me, as things stand now, I've worked with and met a handful of very talented chefs myself, a few of them also William Angles alumni. Um, and one thing that I've loved with my experiences with them and what, uh, with what I've learned from them and my conversation with them was, uh, as you mentioned, you put a lot of yourself on the plate. Um, and I liked hearing the portions of them that they put on that plate, their inspirations and where they came from and what they learned. I wanted to ask you, in your upbringing and even recently, what have been, your, or what have been some of your greatest sources of inspiration or those wells of inspiration? Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. I think, um, once again, it comes back to producers. And, um, but it also comes back to aspiration of um, going to great restaurants around the world and seeing what they're doing and trying to get an understanding of what makes that restaurant great and what the particular food. Um, I think that that's where trying to put that on the plate. But what I've learned, as you get more mature as a chef and a restaurateur, it's simplicity done to perfection. And I think that that's what really inspires me and you're never satisfied obviously with perfection you never reach so you're always continuously striving to produce something that looks really simple but at the same time aspirational and um, wow factor but keeping it as simple as possible so that is extremely difficult particularly for a young chef to say to them um, you've put one too many elements on the plate um, is, you know, it's hard to explain, but it can ruin a dish by just putting that one too many ingredient or one too many techniques on a plate. And that's what I think maturity as a chef, as you grow, you learn that um, to, to restrain and to be confident. And once again, if you're using the best produce in the world, which, you know, we have now, um, confidence just, it, 
it's, it's easy. Um, but it takes years of experience just to be confident in yourself to say that, if that makes sense. I had a maitre d' who used to say, it's fusion, not confusion, with the extra, ele too many elements on the plate. Yeah. We yeah. have a question over here. Thank you for representing the right-hand side of the room. Well done. Thank you. Um, my name is Vasily. I just got a question. What are some key skills and character characteristics you look in a young chef or a young cook that wants to work around you or like in a high-skilled environment? I don't look at the actual skills they have. I, I look more at, at their confidence uh, and their willingness and their passion um, and if they um, understand the word aspiration. That's skills can be learned. If you've got all of that, if you've got the enthusiasm to get up in the morning and get yourself into the kitchen um, in a timely manner with enthusiasm and a smile um, and, and a vision to, you know, not just for about today but for tomorrow, um, all the skills can be learned. So that's what, I just love the fact that um, someone comes in with some energy and just they know that they want to be a chef, they want to learn. Um, whatever skills they bring with them is a bonus. Um, everything else can be learned. Pick them up pretty quickly. I've got another question. Um, so I'm finishing year 12 this year, and most of my friends are starting, oh, let's, let's take a gap here, oh, let's do this, come on, thanks. Last time I worked 60 hours a week, hmm. just, cook, just cooking in many places. Should I just take this opportunity to travel around and taste different uh, stuff? Like, because I come from Greece, I've got different palates and got different experiences. Should I travel the world, taste, and then come back, for example, to this institute and to my course, or straight, the, straight like go to the course and then go on to travel tough the one. world? <laughs> Rear counselor. Yeah, 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 tough one, tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you, Vasily, you know the answer to that yourself. What you're, if you're thinking that you need to take that gap year, you, you're questioning it, then that's what you probably need to do. And you'll still keep learning, no matter what. Just use my advice just to keep being the dumbest person in the room and just keep learning. You know, you get an opportunity to work on a little fishing boat for a couple of weeks when you're there. or um, You know, just try and absorb as much information as you can. But if you feel like then you're double questioning yourself again and you feel, oh, am I, am I going to be fully focused because I'm feeling too guilty, I should have, should have done that course before I, I travelled, then you know the answer. But really you're the only one that can answer that. Sounds to me like you're ready for both. Um, so you've got to make a big decision. But either way, you're not missing out on anything. It's just, it's just in the order. You're still going to be learning and um, becoming a, a, a better person for either. Maybe, maybe another way of looking at it is if you have the skills, if you know you're going to be a chef, then you, you, get, you get the skills, you get the qualification, and then that's your ticket, that's your passport around to those same places. But, but the attitude of tasting and everything still, still exists. You've just got to, you're probably just going to crack a bit more money with the qualification. But, um, but we'll leave that with you. Okay. Uh, time for one last question, because we're right, we've got one minute. Look at all the hands go up, it's always at the end. Uh, well, let's hope whoever, whomever we choose. This lady actually had her hand up first, I think, but Pia, you were there. Um, maybe her question will represent yours. Uh, and if not, I think afterwards we ha I do have time for a bit, a bit of photography and interaction, so don't panic. Thank you. My question is actually to do with intolerant cooking and to do with people that have intolerances, such as your oil intolerances and your butters and your gluten and your wheat and all of those sorts of things. And my daughter, I'm asking on behalf of her, is interested in all of this because our family is completely intolerant. So she's wanting to sort of learn from that side of things. So is this the kind of institute where that is encouraged, as in to learn all about intolerant cooking, to... to to actually be that chef that can actually cater to those people. Because one of the things I have found recently in our journey of all of this is there is hardly any restaurants at all that will cater to, if you, if you are asking for gluten, they'll smother it in oil for flavour. If you're asking for oil in uh, something without oil, they'll actually put butter in it. And it's, it, so what I'm trying to say is that does this learning of becoming a chef, does it also teach how to swap things out and put things in and 
and cater and and actually rip because there's the intolerances are on on the rise the peanut intolerances the then all of those things are massively on the rise and as a cooking situation it's so disappointing to not be able to go out to restaurants because they don't cater and so that's the change that our family and other people I know are looking at is that happening in the industry or are we new to oh, all of this? Definitely. No, it's, it's a huge change. I don't know if you're aware, but there's, uh, particularly in Europe, I mean, it's a criminal offence to you know, serve someone peanuts, oil, if they're allergic to peanuts. Um, you know, it's uh, 20 years ago, obviously, it wasn't taken seriously at all, but now these days, um, being the top restaurants, it's, it's part of the training. It's part of the training for young people. It's part of a briefing each day. There's systems in place. Um, there's menus. So yeah. View de Mon, for instance, has seven or eight different menus um, that are there for different intolerances. Some of those intolerances are quite deadly. If you know, if you, um, if you like a shellfish intolerance, nut intolerance. Um, chefs are even trained now and and front of house to use um, EpiPens. Yep. Um, so it's taken extremely seriously. And if you if you eat at one of the, you know, the really good restaurants in, in Melbourne, which there's well over 100 uh, now, I saw there's a, there was a list in the paper the other day and I recognised a lot of them and I didn't recognise some of them are, you know, look amazing. Um, all those restaurants, you know, take it extremely seriously. Extremely yeah, so, so thanks, Chef. That's really nice to hear from the industry perspective. Yeah, William Angus, we have plenty of students with these intolerances um, and so welcome. Uh, we also, it's, I think it's the second largest unit in our commercial cookery program is called Specialist Cuisines. So we see it as a positive thing um, because it's differentiation, it's something new on the menu, it's an opportunity and what you're experiencing, people aren't taking the opportunity. So uh, even in previous training packages, it was called uh, substitution cooking. We don't really go for that. We like the idea of augmentation, making a dish better knowing that we're subbing something out, what's the opportunity of the ingredient we can put in? So absolutely fantastic question, contemporary issue that's, you know, that now we've, there's no excuses there really. Yeah, I, th I think also it's, you'll notice that in the top restaurants that it's not just you, you're receiving a dish that looks like a substitution. You're actually receiving an experience that actually is a proper experience. It's not just take that ingredient off you, you'll receive a completely different dish. Um, and that because it's been thought through. And I think the, the creative part and what the industry is demanding from its young people coming into the industry is that, yeah, they do think of it and they do understand that the preparation involved when you hit the industry, that you actually do have to create a completely different dish. Um, and you try and, the, the, the goal is to try and um, absorb as many of those intolerances um, into that dish as possible um, so that you've eliminated three extra menus that you have to obviously prepare for. And the other good thing is that people are getting, guests are getting more and more used to actually giving advance notice, which then gives the restaurant no excuses at all to give you a great experience. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Shannon Bennett. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks so much for Gracing us with your presence, Lord Mayor. And then please hang around if you've got questions with you. You've been a fantastic audience. Thank you, Jasmine, Bianca, Jack, Saul, Vasily, Chef Vasily, yes. for your fantastic questions. And Lord Mayor.